Okay, we're going to start in about one minute. Radomir says hi. Hi, Radomir. Hi, Radomir. All right, good. We've got a good sound check over across the pond. Good, good. All right, good morning, everybody. This is Jim Cahill. I'm going to wave my arm, be uh, off camera right here. I'd like to welcome everybody here to our demonar, what we call a demo seminar. Um, from the imaginary shores of Lady Bird Lake here in beautiful Austin, Texas. Today's topic is Dead Time Compensator Mythbuster, and the broadcast is being recorded and will be available for future viewing. So if you find it valuable, please do share it with uh, your colleagues. Uh, the recorded version will be on both my Emerson Process Experts blog and Greg's Modeling and Control blog. And we're muting all but Greg's microphone, so please use the Q&A box, and I'll be monitoring that. And if you have a question during the middle, I'll relay it verbally to Greg. And we, we'd like these to be as interactive as possible, so if a question occurs to you, uh, enter it in the Q&A box, and I'll um, ask Greg during the session. With that, let me turn it over to Greg. Glad you could join us. The uh, topic today is PID compensation. It's sponsored by Emerson, Xperia Tech, and Mina. And it was created by uh, me, Greg McMillan, and uh, Jack Ehlers, who is a control specialist at Monsanto. Uh, the website uh, for the process control labs was created by Charlie Schleiser. Uh, he's a consultant at Xperia Tech, and his company is CS Design Co. Welcome. Uh, this is me. I mean, you probably know me by now. The most important thing here is uh, my website where I've uh, shared what I've learned uh, over my career and, and, uh, and also most recently uh, for about the uh, last four years. Well, uh, just to get things going here, uh, you may be thinking about vacations um, as the weather gets colder. And so, uh, courtesy of a friend, of mine who spent uh, quite a bit of time in Hawaii, uh, Glenn Mertz. Here is uh, the top 10 signs you're ready for a Hawaiian vacation. Uh, you give your boss the hang loose hand gesture. You daydream about hula dancers and hard hats. Your cubicle has a mosquito net with tropical sounds. You bring a kayak to the company's waste pond. You ask, where is the company's poo stand? You tell your secretary she's wearing a nice moo. You play a ukulele in your office. You know, in Austin being live capital, music capital of the world, uh, is a distinct possibility. Number three, you show up at a meeting in a Hawaiian shirt, shorts, and sandals. You start answering your phone saying aloha. And the number one sign, you wear a snorkeling mask instead of glasses. So uh, it has a long history here of dead time compensation that uh, started, uh, if, at least for the process industry, in 1957 when uh, Mr. Smith uh, developed uh, what we call affectionately the Smith predictor. And uh, it's been used um, uh, since then uh, to varying degrees of success. And actually, a lot of the dead time compensators we have today uh, could be reduced mathematically if you try hard enough uh, to the Smith predictor. Uh, if you look at a transfer function for it, it can get a little bit confusing, so I try to simplify it here. And, and the key thing is right here that you take the controller output and you pass it through a multiplier uh, for the process gain, a filter for the process time constant, and a dead time block for the process dead time to create a model of the process with a dead time. 
the key thing here, it is subtracted from the PV. Now, if you have a perfect model of the process and you subtract it from the PV, what you end up with is zero. Well, that wouldn't be very good as a PV. So the next step is you take the controller output and you pass it just through a multiplier block for the process gain and a filter block for the process time constant to create a model of the process without the dead time. That is then added to the PV. So if you had a perfect model, what you end up for a PV is a model of the process without the dead time. And if this is truly the case, uh, the controller should like that and, uh, and possibly do better. However, the user must adjust the process gain, process time constant, and process dead time. And the user in the PID sees a PV, a process variable, without dead time. It doesn't see the actual process variable. So you need a special faceplate. Maybe even a uh, dummy controller just tracking the uh, controller, uh, the PID doing the real work, just for the operator interface uh, so that operations and engineering uh, sees a faceplate with the actual PV instead of this uh, model PV. Uh, there have been uh, a lot of dead time compensators uh, developed um, and uh, coming out of uh, various university programs, and they're interesting, but uh, rarely did they make it into the process industry. What we're going to show and concentrate on is the simplest dead time compensator that inserts a dead time block in the back L path, uh, the external reset path, uh, between the AO and the uh, PID blocks. And um, Terry Blevin showed that uh, in a previous paper that mathematically uh, for uh, lambda tuning settings, uh, this uh, is equivalent uh, to a Smith predictor. Uh, however, it has some significant advantages in terms of actually when pushed uh, through tuning to work better, uh, we think, and also we think is a lot simpler. Um, it works for the positive feedback integral mode, uh, which is what we have in delta V, but not for the conventional integral mode like we have in Provox. Uh, the dynamic reset limit option must be enabled, which is a good idea anyway for slow valves and slow secondary loops, as we've seen in a previous seminar. The user only needs to adjust the dead time. He doesn't have to worry about the process gain or uh, the process time constant. The user and the PID sees the actual PV, so you don't need any special uh, faceplate. And according to my tests, uh, the external reset dead time compensator is actually less sensitive than the Smith predictor to model errors. There's a lot of myths or misconceptions that have been developed over the years, and we're going to expose as many of them as possible. The first misconception is that dead time is really eliminated from the loop. The second one is just by adding a dead time compensator, the control is faster uh, with the existing tuning settings. Third misconception. Uh, the compensator works best for loops dominated by a large dead time. You would think, hey, if there's a lot of dead time, putting in a dead time compensator would be the more effective thing to do. Um, an underestimate of a dead time leads to instability. This is what we're used to in, in terms of tuning controllers. If we underestimate the dead time in our tuning calculations, we're going to get into some instability. Well, what we see with, uh, what we'll show with the uh, dead time compensator, what happens is contrary to these uh, PID tuning calculations in terms of the effect of an underestimate. An overestimate of the dead time uh, leads to sluggish response and greater stability according to what we're used to uh, seeing in terms of the tuning calculations for PID. And so what we're going to show is contrary to these PID tuning calculations. Uh, and, uh, and we'll actually see that there is a window um, of allowable um, 
dead time settings and, uh, and tuning settings. I'll just briefly summarize the importance of, uh, of delay. Uh, without dead time, I would be out of a job. Um, the control of errors could be zero. You could set the tuning settings as fast as you want. Uh, fortunately, uh, I've never seen a loop without dead time. It has, uh, it has been shown in a simulation on, uh, in a university paper where a person put in a single process time constant and uh, he could set the gain very high, was very proud of it, but uh, there's really no limit how high you could go with gain, what performance you would get if there's a zero dead time. Uh, so it's probably the deadliest attribute of the, of the control loop, so naturally people try to develop compensators to deal with it. A more descriptive name would be total loop dead time. The loop dead time is the amount of time from the start of a change you completely circle the control loop and end up at the point of origin. For example, an unmeasured disturbance cannot be corrected until the change is seen and the correction arrives in a process as the same, at the same point as the disturbance. Uh, the process dead time offers a continuous uh, train of values where digital devices and analyzers offer discontinuous data values at discrete intervals. Uh, so we've got different uh, characteristics here, but both of these delays add a phase shift and increase the ultimate period, decrease the natural, natural frequency. And so they have a somewhat similar degrading effects, although there are some other implications in terms of whether you have a continuous train of values versus a, a non-continuous uh, set of values at discrete intervals. Our goals are to minimize delay wherever it appears. The loop must see the upset and enact a correction as fast as possible. What are the sources? Uh, pure delay comes from process dead times and discontinuous updates. Uh, piping, duct, plug flow, reactor, conveyor, extruder, spin line, and treat transportation delays are classic examples of process dead time. And what's interesting is they are set by the mechanical design. Uh, and the remaining delays that we're going to see here are set by automation uh, design. So you as an automation engineer have control of the rest of these delays and uh, in many loops, as we'll see actually in the majority of the loops, you have uh, control over the amount of delay that's in, 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 the, in the process, or not in the process, but in the total control loop. Um, digital device scan update uh, reporting and execution times, and here about half of that time interval ends up being uh, an effective delay in terms of what you see for the ultimate period. Uh, analyzer sample processing and analysis cycle time, and here about one and a half times the time interval is uh, what you see in terms of its effect uh, on the natural period of the loop. And why is it one and a half times? Well, because the result is at the end of the time interval, whereas for digital type or, uh, uh, update times and execution times, the result is typically available at the beginning of the interval. The fact that an analyzer uh, result is at the end of the interval uh, causes uh, you to go from 0.5 to 1.5 times that delta T uh, of the time interval. Um, then if you consider that controller outputs are not making big step changes but are actually ramping, uh, then uh, as it, the time it takes for the controller output to ramp through the sensitivity or resolution limit or the backlash deadpan uh, limit adds additional dead time. So what's interesting, if you do an open loop test here, which is typically a big step, big enough to get through the sensitivity and backlash, so you get a response, you're not going to see this dead time. But your BID controller output hopefully is not making these big steps from um, module execution to module execution. And um, as a result, uh, it's ramping its output. And what it sees is uh, then a process dead time in terms of its ability, or uh, a total loop dead time in terms of its ability to uh, react to unmeasured disturbances. Uh, there's also equivalent delay from lags. Uh, if you have time constants in series, and, and this goes all the way back to what Ziegler-Nichols documented in uh, 1947, 
um, th that that creates effectively a dead time. So these process lags in series from mixing column trays, dip tubes, uh, size, location, heat transfer surfaces, and, and volumes uh, creates process lags, and these are largely set by the mechanical design again. Now, the remaining lags are set by uh, the automation design. So you, uh, again, as a, an automation engineer, have a control over a significant source of lags. And again, actually, most of the loops have delay. The, the largest source of delay is really within your realm of, uh, of, of correcting uh, through the automation system design. And so equivalent lags uh, in the automation system design are from thermal wells, electrodes, uh, transmitter damping settings, and uh, signal filters. Uh, we've seen this a lot of times before, so I'm not going to go into it except uh, to say that uh, here, <coughs> uh, what we're going to key on is the observe uh, total loop dead time. And uh, when we get a change in controller output right here, the amount of time that it takes to get out of the noise band, so we have a recognizable change in the control variable is right here. And so that time interval is uh, the total uh, loop dead time. Now, where do these dead times come from? Well, this diagram that we have shown before uh, is a very good way of visualizing this. Uh, hopefully, uh, the largest time constant is uh, right here in the process. And any of the other lags or time constants, and we use interchangeably the words lags and time constants, uh, just as we use interchangeably the word delay and dead time. But anyway, getting back, uh, any of the uh, smaller lags or time constants then uh, summed up uh, become uh, additional equivalent uh, delay. And of course, you sum up all the pure delays. So for the control valve, you have a pure delay here. You have uh, actually more than one lag. Um, here, and it's, uh, and it's, uh, it's velocity limited by the stroking time. Uh, you have another uh, la uh, delay here at, at maybe a, uh, prior to the entrance of the disturbance, and another process lag here prior to the entrance of the disturbance. Uh, then you got the disturbance coming in here, and uh, it's important in terms of studying the effect of disturbances that you know uh, what the lag is and uh, what the gain is, so you know the speed and size of the disturbance. Um, then you have a delay downstream of the disturbance. And here you'd like this lag to be as uh, large as possible here, again, um, because this slows down the disturbance. Uh, then you have the process gain that translates it to a PV and engineering use that you see in your trend recording. Uh, then, uh, in the measurement, uh, you have uh, sensor delays and lags. You have uh, transmitter delays and lags. And then you have a, a gain associated with the measurement uh, that is really based on uh, the calibration span uh, and scale that you see uh, on your PID controller. You get into the PID controller and the analog inputs our, our digital inputs uh, often have filtering. There's an execution time or scan time of, uh, associated with those inputs. And then you could be putting a filter in the analog input block. You could be putting a filter in uh, the PID block. Uh, and if you uh, add up all of these pure delays and small time constants or small lags in series, uh, you end up with a first order approximation of the uh, total loop dead time. And if you think about it, um, uh, you as an automation engineer has set uh, the an for analyzer flow, pressure level, speed, surge, and static mixture control, you are really setting uh, the biggest part of, of the total loop dead time because for these uh, applications here, uh, the process dead time is uh, rather small. Uh, we've seen this before. I'm not going to go into it uh, other than to say uh, that uh, as a reminder uh, that, the, that the limit to what you see in performance uh, observed uh, it, as a practical matter depends upon the controller gain settings. And so the peak error 
really is inversely related to the controller gain here. And so how much uh, you reduce the open loop error, which is the error if you didn't have a PID controller or the PID controller was a manual, and, and you would be taking the, the fastest and largest uh, load disturbance here. How much is that reduced? Well, how much it is reduced depends upon this term here. And again, that's inversely proportional to the controller gain. And technically here, the product of the process gain and the controller gain. And, um, and the process gain here uh, really is the total of the gain factors, the valve gain, uh, what really is the process variable gain, and then uh, the measurement uh, gain associated with the calibration span. So uh, it's really, uh, you know, the total open loop gain at that point. Now, if we look at the integrated error, uh, we see that in the numerator is uh, the interval time. And uh, for a small uh, module execution time, we can just simply add that to show its effect. And similarly, for small filter times, we can add it and show its effect in the numerator. And in terms of uh, what happens for an integrated um, error. Now, technically, this is not the integrated absolute error, but hopefully the loop is tuned. So it's not oscillatory, or the oscillations are minimal. So it is effectively the integrated absolute error. But uh, you got to realize you can't do you, you can't do better than the ultimate limit for uh, for the control loop. In other words, uh, just because you keep increasing the gain or decreasing the interval time, it doesn't mean you're going to do better. In fact, uh, you can get into instabilities. But the limit to how much better you're going to do as you make the tuning faster is uh, set by uh, the loop dead time and process time constant. And uh, so that's what we have uh, here. Um, uh, and uh, as a reminder, uh, most of the loops we see, the total loop dead time is really set by the automation uh, system design. Hopefully, the largest lag in the loop is, uh, is set by the process volume, and that slows down the effect of disturbances. And uh, as we go, uh, and this, of course, was the for the peak error, that it's proportional to the ratio of the loop dead time uh, to the 63% response time, which is 63 percent response time is just the sum of the dead time plus uh, its process time constant. So the peak error is, is, is really proportional to the loop dead time. You get into uh, 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 the integrated error, and it's proportional to the loop dead time squared uh, to the 63 percent response time. And so you can see the dramatic effect of a loop uh, dead time in terms of the ultimate limit. Now, you can get into some very confusing situations here if your um, largest time constant is not in the process as desired, but uh, happens to be, say, in the electrode or thermal well lag. Or I've seen uh, actually quite often on very fast loops, like compressor loops um, and liquid pressure loops in a signal filter. Uh, and so what you're seeing then uh, is a very attenuated version of the uh, real world. And you can use the equation we presented in previous seminars, well, in the last one, uh, in, uh, the, the firmer, seminar number nine, to, uh, to actually then calculate what is the unfiltered uh, actual process variable um, uh, uh, from, from the equation uh, for the attenuation. So you can kind of get an idea, even though you have no measurement of it, what is the actual process doing? as a result of you seeing a very filtered or attenuated version of the real world. OK, well, we're going to concentrate on self-regulating processes for the dead time compensation, which is classically where you see the dead time compensator has been applied. And uh, what we've seen from uh, previous uh, seminars is, uh, is, the, is this particularly for the primer, uh, we, we have these equations here for controller tuning. and. Uh, uh, what we're going to show is that, that this factor here, uh, which is normally 0 0.4, that if we do, you do our dead time compensator right and have an accurate dead time, we can potentially increase that to uh, 1.0. And so um, uh, that's going to be an appreciable improvement in terms of the controller gain. In fact, you can increase it by 250%. What we're going to see uh, for a dead time uh, dominant loop, uh, where uh, the uh, process time constant is much less than the dead time, 
um, which you would think would be the major application for dead time compensators. But again, uh, this factor here, uh, we can increase that to 1.0. What's interesting, we have seen from seminar number one and uh, from uh, the present work in a short course I did at uh, Emerson Exchange, uh, that we also get to set that or increase it from 0.4 to 1.0. Uh, for the wireless PID called PID Plus, if we have a, uh, an analyzer or a wireless update delay such that it creates a, a really a, a delay much uh, much greater again uh, than the than the process time constant. So uh, for those wireless applications where we're trying to save on, on battery life and for analyzer applications where we have long analyzer cycle time compared to the process time constant, uh, we can uh, use a, a, a PID uh, modification uh, for, for wireless called PID Plus and uh, we have the opportunity as we've seen in uh, demo number one to increase that to uh, 1.0. Now, the Smith predictor um, uh, requires a bunch of blocks, uh, and here I'm showing the embedded composite. You take uh, the PID output, and uh, you run it through a multiplier block here, uh, where you're multiplying by the process gain, and uh, then you send it through a filter block by uh, multiplying by the process lag or time constant. Uh, then you take that, and you put that into uh, input number one. Um, you then also do the same thing, uh, but you uh, take the signal here at this point and uh, you send it through a dead time block. Um, and, and so now with going through the dead time block, you have a, a, a model of the process uh, with the dead time. You have a P, PD with the dead time and um, you send that to input number two, which is a subtraction, so you get a negative sign there. Uh, this negative sign, if you carry it through as a, as a, as a bias to the PV, um, <clears throat> ends up uh, for a perfect model uh, subtracting out from the PV and ending up with zero for your PV. Uh, you're then using input one here uh, as, uh, as what the PV will be uh, for the PID uh, uh, algorithm. Uh, unfortunately, this is not what the operator and, and, and also some engineers and maintenance wants to see. It can be very confusing, so you have to take care of that through um, some special configuration and phase plate designs. Now, compare that to uh, just adding a dead time block here. And uh, what you do is you insert it uh, on the output of the back cal out. Um, uh, and uh, take that uh, as an input here, and then for the output of that, uh, we'll go to the back cal in of the PID, but here we've got a, an external reset block for, uh, for simulating PID plus in versions earlier than Delta V11. Uh, but, you know, basically what's coming out of here uh, is uh, what would be coming out of the dead time compensator and ending up in the back cow path right there. Uh, so um, you, could, you could simply insert this dead time block. And with the dead time of zero, it have no effect. So it's not like it's doing, you know, causing any problem. And maybe you could try it out uh, on some of the loops where you think uh, it's important to, to do uh, better. So we got a demo, and the first demo, uh, what we're going to do is concentrate on a, uh, 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 a loop where the process lag is uh, much uh, greater than the process delay. Uh, and so that's going to be set up by these uh, parameters here. Uh, then we're going to go on, if we do that demo, and we're going to uh, do one well, it's the opposite situation where the process delay is much uh, greater than the process lag, and uh, people often call this a dead time dominant loop. And so here, by setting the process up uh, this way with the delay, uh, particularly in the primary process, uh, much larger than uh, the lag in the primary process, we, we have the situation of a dead time uh, dominant loop. 
So uh, for this, I'm going to share my desktop, and I'll uh, get the, the demo started. Well, here we are at the uh, main screen uh, for the Process Control Lab. And if you come into this, uh, you, short, you should hit the Restore Labs to the Initial State button in case uh, somebody left it uh, with their interesting results. Um, we're going to work on the single loop lab, so let's uh, do that. And uh, uh, we're going to uh, <clears throat> uh, open up the faceplate and the tuning settings here. And uh, we can click on any of these blocks here in the block diagram uh, to get at the details uh, for uh, PID process measurements, disturbances, and control valves. So let's go back here to our, uh, uh, our list of, uh, of what we're going to do here as instructions for the demo. And uh, in the process detail, we're going to set the, uh, the delay equal to one second in both the primary and secondary uh, process. And uh, we're going to make sure that the primary lag 2 is 10 seconds and the secondary uh, uh, lag 2 is 1 second. Well, let's do that. <clears throat> uh, we're already set up with a delay of one second there, 10 seconds for both the increasing and decreasing direction uh, of the uh, primary lag 2. And here, uh, we already got one second delay, but here uh, we have, uh, for the secondary lag, uh, we have uh, two seconds, so we're going to change that to one second. So this is uh, more closely like a first order process, although if you look at it here, you could take this lag as almost being, being much smaller than uh, this lag as uh, equivalent dead time. So how much dead time do we have in this loop? Well, we got one, uh, two, we had uh, this and three, and then we got some dead time from uh, the PID module execution. So we have between uh, three and four seconds of dead time. Uh, let's go in and make sure the controller tuning settings have a gain of one, a reset of 10, and a rate of zero. So uh, yeah, that's what we have, so we're all set there. Um, uh, now we're going to enable the set point metrics and uh, see how we do with just a traditional PID um, uh, for a set point change from uh, 50 to 60 percent. So, oh, I didn't enable the set point metrics. Uh, so I want to do that first. <coughs> Now that they're enabled, uh, whenever there's a set point change, it will uh, re-zero everything and calculate uh, uh, the rise time. How long does it take to get the set point settling time? How long does it take to settle out of the set point? The overshoot, uh, the initial excursion past the set point, and then the undershoot, uh, like uh, how much did it then, uh, after maybe uh, hit close to the set point, did it go uh, the other way? Uh, uh, and, uh, and corresponding to an undershoot. Um, so now we're ready uh, to make the set point change. <coughs> and we can look at the trend recording and uh, see what's happening there. And so this is a, a traditional PID, nothing special. Um, I didn't spend a whole lot of time tuning this. Um, you can tell by the rounded off numbers. Uh, was that interesting conversation with James Bell, and I asked, well, why do you have like uh, three significant figures in your tuning calculations when really uh, probably only the first matters, or, or maybe sometimes the second because of nonlinearities and, and changes uh, with time? He said, well, I know that uh, I've tuned it that way. If it's a rounded off number, I'm not so sure if it was really tuned. So interesting kind of perspective. Here we are, and we have gotten right to set point. Things uh, look pretty good. And let's see what the set point metrics are. Um, we had no overshoot, um, but it did take uh, 23 and a half seconds uh, rise time. And since there was no overshoot, the settling time and the rise time is the same. So uh, that's pretty good. Um, but hey, uh, dead time compensation is supposed to be a good idea, so uh, let's, uh, let's go ahead and do that. 
Um, so we're going to enable the dynamic reset limit and uh, set the PID dead time for a dead time compensation to four seconds. Now remember I totaled it up as like between three and four, and in general you want to set uh, the dead time compensation to be um, rounded up. And so I've rounded it up to uh, four seconds. And then we're going to make another set point change from 60 to 50 and uh, no metrics. So uh, let's go to the PID detail. And first thing we need to do is uh, enable the dynamic reset limit. And uh, then we need to enter uh, what we think is the total loop dead time rounded up for uh, the control loop. Um, and we're all set to go. So now uh, we're going to make another set point change. Um, uh, 60 to 50. <coughs> and notice the uh, set point metrics are zero the amount, so uh, it's on its way. We'll see uh, what what the results are of doing something what we think is going to be better by compensating for dead time. And so let's uh, look at how that's developing. Well, you can already see uh, that it, it looks a little slower. Uh, it's taking longer to reach set point. And that's going to show up in the metrics. Here uh, we were at about 23 and a half seconds, and uh, now uh, we've uh, almost doubled it to 40 and a half. Half second. So just turning on uh, dead time compensation, it uh, looks like, oh, we're, we're doing worse. And if you did it uh, that way, so why the heck would I use dead time compensation? It's actually, you know, unless you want a slower response, but you could have gotten that by slowing down the tuning. Um, you know, what is dead time compensation really doing for me? Uh, so um, uh, let's uh, uh, let, let's uh, take advantage of the dead time compensation by retuning it, and in particular, uh, we're going to uh, increase the gain uh, by 250 percent, and uh, then we're going to make another set point change and uh, note the metrics. So um, let's increase that by 250 percent, make that 2.5. Okay, uh, now we'll make another set point change and uh, see uh, what happens. Well, already with the controller output uh, taking a much uh, bigger jump, uh, we ought to get there faster. And uh, it is becoming very obvious uh, that we have gotten there very fast. And if we look at the metrics here, you know, for uh, the traditional PID, where we were at uh, 22 and a half seconds, we're now at 10 seconds. We have a tiny, well, this is negligible. I mean, you got noise uh, only in there, a larger than that. So the overshoot and undershoot really uh, is uh, not significant. And if we kind of zoom in on this, uh, we can see, boy, that looks like a pretty darn good response. And and so even though this was a, a loop where you wouldn't think dead time compensation would help you, and initially it made things worse, uh, we find that if we tune the controller more aggressively, simply increasing the gain by 250%, uh, uh, we can do dramatically better here in set point response. And if we were to do uh, a low disturbance test by putting this lab in uh, the run mode, we would see uh, a similar dramatic improvement uh, in both uh, the peak error and uh, the integrated absolute error um, uh, for this case. Uh, so uh, <coughs> let's see, though. Hey, can uh, can we reduce the reset time? Uh, because uh, as noted for dead time and dominant loops, uh, that is a possibility. So we're going to try uh, what's going to happen here by uh, cutting the reset time in half. And we're going to make another set point change. <clears throat> and we'll see what happens. Well, we got the same, actually a little bit bigger kick. Things look okay right now. 
Uh, but, uh, hmm, looks like we're going to have a little bit of overshoot there. And uh, uh, it's appreciable enough uh, where the settling time is going to be much greater than the rise time. And so while it's uh, maybe not a killer, um, certainly uh, the response doesn't uh, look as good here as, as it was for uh, the original uh, situation. And so uh, the message is here for loops that are not uh, uh, dead time dominant. <coughs> uh, and we, we start to decrease the reset time, we're actually not going to do as good as if we just left the reset time below, assuming it was tuned correctly and, uh, and went uh, with a much higher control gain. So going back to the de uh, demo, we're going to put the reset time back at uh, 10 seconds, which was the best setting. And then we're going to see, well, what if you don't have an accurate uh, dead time? So first we're going to see, uh, what about uh, a dead time of uh, two seconds, where uh, essentially, well, we've got half. Uh, it doesn't sound like much, but in terms of uh, percentage-wise, uh, this is 50% of, uh, of what the dead time should be. And, you know, we have everything scaled here to be fast, but uh, in a real-life process, uh, the process time constant would, say, be... Uh, uh, instead of 10 seconds, would be 1,000 seconds. And this uh, process dead time, uh, instead of 4 seconds, would be 400 seconds. And uh, I'm confident that and for that case, we could cut that 50% of the 400 seconds to 200 seconds and uh, have uh, the same effect that we're going to observe here. So uh, let's try that and see what happens. So we'll set this back at what uh, the original reset time was, which uh, gave us a nice response. And uh, then we're going to go in here and we're going to say, oh, well, we underestimated uh, uh, the dead time by uh, 50%. And so uh, what's going to happen now? Well, let's make another set point change to see that. <coughs> Well, hey, not too bad. Uh, certainly not as good as uh, before, but, uh, you know, if you look at uh, this response here, uh, there's a little bit of overshoot, so it's not as good as here, uh, but not uh, as bad as like that. So, uh, you know, just not that bad a deal. What happens is you uh, underestimate the dead time, you just keep you just go back to actually what the effect would be if you didn't have a dead time compensator. And because uh, we uh, more aggressively tune the controller gain, if we go back to the traditional PID, it's going to become oscillatory uh, for that additional controller gain where, you know, we increased it by 250%, which is uh, quite a bit. So um, <clears throat> um, what about an overestimate? Of, uh, of a dead time. So let's set it at 8 seconds and uh, see uh, what happens then. So we have twice as much uh, dead time. Uh, we've overestimated it by twice as much. Now, if you did this in the tuning of a controller, uh, and put like twice the dead time in the PID calculations, uh, you'd be in a lot of trouble. Uh, what we find here is that we've created some, uh, uh, some undershoot, some significant undershoot, and you can see that's tallying up right here. And, uh, and we're starting to get some, uh, you know, kind of a jagged response, but here we're way off uh, in our dead time estimate by, uh, by 100%. Uh, now let's uh, make it off by uh, 400%. So uh, let's set the dead time to uh, 16 seconds. And make another set point change. Mm -hmm.
and it's going to get more jagged. Uh, so uh, we clearly have created a problem here. Uh, and so where the PID controller, if you overestimate uh, the dead time in your tuning calculation, it just becomes sluggish. Where the dead time compensator, if you overestimate that dead time um, and, and you insert it that way, uh, you actually get into this jagged response. Uh, although it's uh, maybe uh, not real bad here, it's just going to continue on. So let's uh, go on with the next demo. And um, here we're going to study uh, a uh, process delay that uh, is uh, greater than the process lag. Um, so we're going to really change the process quite a bit. So we better put it in manual and uh, get everything set at 50%. And then we'll go ahead and start changing uh, the process uh, so that we have a delay uh, here of nine seconds and everything else is one second. So we have a dead time dominant uh, situation here. So let's put this in manual. <coughs> uh, output 50%. Uh, put the set point at 50%. And uh, now we're going to really change the process quite a bit. Um, well, all actually we have to do is let's uh, take that big process lag out in there. And we're going to put in a big process dead time, nine seconds. I think everything else changed, uh, stays the same. So uh, I think we're good to go there. Let's uh, go back and check here. Um, so we, uh, I think we've done that. <clears throat> now we need to enter the tuning settings uh, so that uh, we're stable. We got again. This is dead time dominant, and if you go back to that slide, uh, the gain is 0.4 uh, times the inverse uh, of the process gain. The process gain here is one. Uh, we're going to set the reset to uh, five seconds. Um, and uh, the rate to, to zero, naturally, if you're dead time dominant. And the reset of five seconds is about half of the total of dead time. Total of dead time, uh, we go back here, is uh, the pure delays of nine plus one. That's ten. And then we got a time constant in series. So we got about uh, maybe uh, uh, between ten and eleven here, if you had, and also the module execution time. Uh, so we have a reset time of five. Um, we're going to put this then in, uh, oh, we've got to make sure that we take out the dynamic reset limit and test it without the dead time compensation for these tuning settings. So uh, let's do that. I'm uh, going to put this at 0 0.4, put this at 5, and we'll go in here and take out this dead time compensation. Okay, and looks like we're all set. We can put this in automatic, and uh, we can make a set point change and we'll see how we do. I can hang with us here. We're going to go pretty quick through this demo, and um, we may be a couple of minutes over, but we don't have uh, hardly any more slides to show. So uh, once we get through the demos, we're just about done. All right, let's see what's happening here. Well, we got a dead time dominant loop, so boy, it's taking a lot longer to get going here. It looks like there's going to be a little bit of overshoot. Well, there's quite a bit of overshoot, but that's one of the problems. This probably could have been tuned better, but uh, let's just go with the starting point. Dead time dominant loops are, are tougher to tune. Um, let's go here and then see um, uh, what if we uh, use this dead time compensating feature? So let's enable the dynamic reset limit and uh, set the PID dead time at 11 seconds. And then we're going to go ahead and make a, a set point change. So uh, we're going to enable this now. And uh, we'll see how it does with the dead time compensation. Uh, but without any retuning. Well, we have a little bit of a problem here, and the controller is stuck in the manual. Oh, okay. We're going to have to uh, probably do this test again. It was, uh, it was momentarily on it. Or we can just 
uh, you can kind of see it's going to be slow. The same situation that we saw with the, uh, the other type of loop where we had a process lag much greater than the dead time. Um, uh, we're into actually a, a slower, uh, slower response just by adding dead time compensation. Uh, and so uh, that's clearly uh, not desirable. So what we need to do here uh, is to increase the control gain by 250%. And uh, so we're going to do that. <clears throat> uh, that's going to help us get to set point, hopefully, a little faster. Uh, and uh, while that's still happening, um, what we're going to do as the next test, then, is say, well, with the dead time uh, uh, compensator, we have uh, an opportunity with a dead time dominant loop. Uh, unlike before, the last demo, we now can uh, significantly uh, decrease the reset time. So we're going to try a reset time of uh, 1 second and uh, 0.6 seconds. Uh, but first, we'll, uh, we'll try it out with the conventional settings. And actually, <coughs> doesn't seem to like uh, doesn't seem to like these settings. Should the game be 1 or 2.5? Oh, sorry. Thanks, Jim. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, well, uh, it's good to have another person looking at this. <clears throat> I said I'd increase the game by 250%. Uh, and so I put in 2.5 and really 250% increase there. Uh, let's settle this out uh, by putting everything at 50% and we'll make our test. Uh, nice patch there. Uh, that's uh, sort of the excitement of doing demos in that uh, uh, <coughs> you, if you make a mistake, uh, uh, you've got to have somebody helping you learn to get back to where you need to be. Okay. So uh, now I got the right controller again, <laughs> and we can make a set point change, and we'll see what happens. <coughs> so now I got a gain of uh, one compared to point four, uh, where we started from. Yeah, that's not too bad. Um, but uh, if you look at the metrics over here, uh, we've got quite a bit of undershoot. And this is uh, kind of typical <coughs> of what you would see if you don't uh, decrease the reset time. Uh, and reset tends to create overshoot. Uh, you end up with uh, quite a bit of, of undershoot. So let's go ahead and, uh, and change that to one second. <coughs> Um, and see if we can now eliminate a lot of that uh, undershoot. <coughs> so this is kind of, uh, you know, contrary to what you normally see, uh, by having too large of a reset time, uh, we were kind of oscillatory. Uh, and now we, we, with the dead time compensator, we reduce the reset time, and what happens is uh, it becomes smoother. Uh, now there's still some undershoot, so, well, let's continue to uh, decrease uh, the reset time uh, to get rid of that. And so uh, let's set it to 0 0.5. And uh, we'll make another set point change here to 60%. And see if, uh, as a result of uh, continuing to uh, decrease uh, the reset time, we're actually getting better, uh, and particularly in terms of eliminating uh, the, the undershoot. And if we maybe zoom in here, uh, we see uh, 
here uh, we're doing uh, we're doing better here uh, and it actually looks more stable uh, than here by uh, decreasing the reset time so that's uh, counterintuitive uh, so we're doing better and you know uh, there is some optimum here but we're doing I think uh, pretty darn good compared to where we started so um, <clears throat> Let's see what happens now if uh, we uh, go with a dead time estimate that is uh, too small. And in this case, it's, uh, you know, it's, instead of the 11 seconds, we're at 8 seconds. So uh, we're almost 30% uh, less than uh, where we should be. And uh, let's see what happens. So we go here, PID, and enter 8 seconds. <coughs> and now make a set point change. So let's see what happens for an underestimate of uh, the dead time. Uh, what you expect? Uh, well, I think it's going to become a little more oscillatory, a little more overshoot. We're going to degrade to, uh, in some ways, to the situation we would have uh, without dead time compensation. Although one of the things that are kind of characteristic about dead time compensation is uh, is a sort of jagged response and. And so uh, that's a sure clue uh, that you have a, a dead time estimate uh, that is off. So this doesn't look too good, although uh, it's maybe, uh, you know, well, it's, it's kind of us. Uh, these jagged oscillations are, are going to keep going uh, for a while. Uh, now let's see what happens if we uh, overestimate the dead time by just one second, which is uh, less than 10%. So here, uh, let's go to 12 seconds, and uh, <clears throat> we make a set point change. Well, I didn't even have to make a set point change. It, it doesn't like it because we were already uh, upset. And uh, if, we, if we were to, to calm this down and put this in manual at uh, 50%, and, uh, and get this uh, kind of at a calm state. Uh, then put it in auto. <laughs> and it's, it's taking a little bit of time to calm down. Okay, we go to auto here. And so now uh, we'll make a set point change and see what happens. So we're just over in our estimate by less than 10%. Now, with, with the other demo, gosh, we, we could be over with our estimate by, uh, gee, a huge amount, by uh, uh, maybe, uh, I've forgotten, by 100%. Uh, and, uh, and then, you know, a little bit jagged. But here, uh, we're going to see what happens for less than 10%. We're starting to see a problem. And you can see... Actually, if you had some oscillatory disturbance, this problem could uh, possibly be worse uh, by the fact we've got uh, some jagged uh, response going on here. So let's uh, now uh, see what happens if we uh, go to 14 seconds. And in other words, we're a little less than 30% uh, over. And so uh, let's go here and uh, set this to you know, 14 seconds. And make another set point change, 50 percent. Uh, <clears throat> well, uh, once it gets going here, we're gonna. It may look all okay in the beginning, but whoops, there's this kind of like a jagged uh, sawtooth. Uh, well, not really a nice sawtooth. It's a pretty regular pattern. And so we're going to have some problems here. And uh, this can actually get worse over time. Uh, so uh, what if we say, hey, hey, clearly we've created a problem. Let's go back and try and stabilize this and go with what we think is a better dead time estimate. And then we'll see uh, what happens here. And uh, we can... Uh, Wait a little bit of time. Hey, it already looks like it's settling out. So, I mean, the good news is you could uh, <laughs> say that. 
You could uh, kind of settle things out uh, pretty pretty quickly uh, if you could get into uh, the right dead time. However, there's very little margin for error for a dead time dominant loop. So, uh, you know, where you think you'd like to apply it actually can be uh, problematic. So um, let's go back uh, to uh, our seminar and wind up here. Uh, this is the Process Control Lab uh, website, and uh, uh, we've developed a uh, much better method of access that will be available next week that eliminates the IT security issues, operator graphics resolution errors, and remote access response delays. So we're very excited about that, and I hope uh, you'll, you'll get to try it out then uh, next week. Okay, just to summarize here. Um, uh, dead time is not eliminated by a dead time compensator. The limit to the loop performance of run measured load disturbances is still dictated by the total of dead time. The loop cannot correct until it sees the upset and enacts a change that compensates for the upset. Now, while that's logical, it's sometimes forgotten in the excitement about doing dead time compensation. Uh, the, the response of a PID with dead time compensation will actually be slower unless the PID is retuned to have a much higher gain. Improvement performance is greater for loops, uh, actually where the process lag is greater than the process delay, which is good news since uh, very few loops are truly dead time dominant uh, that are of interest. The flow loop is kind of marginal on whether it is or not, depending upon the signal filtering and transmitter damping settings and the control valve uh, lags. Anyway, uh, uh, you, the classic dead time dominant loops are like extruders and sheets and, and, and stuff like that. Um, a decrease in estimated dead time causes the response to degrade to a PID without dead time compensation. An increase in estimated dead time causes a jagged response. A loop dominated by a process lag is much less sensitive to a larger than needed dead time than a loop that's dominated by process dead time. To minimize rise time and peak error, the PID gain is increased. For loops uh, dominated by a process lag, only the PI gain is increased. But for loops dominated by a process delay, the PID gain is increased and the reset time is decreased. The larger the process delay is compared to the process lag, the greater is the decrease in the reset time. If the reset, and this is important here, if the reset time is not decreased, there will be severe undershoot. So actually, you, you get a much smoother, more stable response by decreasing reset time, and that's uh, counterintuitive. All right. Well, I want to thank everybody. We're, we're just about a minute over. But uh, as you're thinking about your questions, and please, if you've got some, enter them in that Q&A box. Um, I put out a comment, but I want to reiterate it here. We'd love any feedback you have on today's uh, seminar, or even if you've been to any of the earlier ones. And here's a website location for a single question, single comment survey to be able to help us out. So appreciate your feedback. Okay, the subject of the next seminar is going to be feed-forward control, how to set up and adjust the dynamic compensation of feed-forward signals. And we'll be having that on Wednesday, November 17th, same time, which is 10 a.m. U.S. Central Time or 1500 UTC. And as I mentioned at the start, the recording of today's seminar will be available on both my Emerson Process Experts blog and Greg's modelingandcontrol.com blog. So with, with all that, uh, we'd love any questions you have, and we'll maintain a period of silence looking for those to come in. Okay, any questions?
All right. Well, thanks, everybody, for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you on November 17th. Have a good one.